this uh, panel tonight is um, very interesting. Um, over the years, we've had, first, we've never had um, any of these three doctors um, at the conference before. And a lot of our panels and lectures for years have focused a lot on obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Um, subject of cancer, we've always uh, felt a little less clear on. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to ask questions and see what everyone has to say about cancer. Um, uh, if each of you could introduce yourself and tell us what your latest book is and what you've been doing the last 20 years so we could get a little more familiar with you, that would be great. If we can, we could go in the order of Dr. Campbell, Dr. Funk, and then Dr. Bard, that would be a good order to go. Sure, sure. so um, I'm at the University of Rochester. I'm an assistant professor. And I've been focusing more recently on research in that role. So um, we have a research nutrition and uh, research center, nutrition and medicine research center. And we've run a small clinical trial, a pilot study looking at um, women with metastatic breast cancer and giving them a very strict whole food plant-based diet for eight weeks, um, just to get some initial um, pilot preliminary type of data. Um, I'm also running a clinical trial on um, type two diabetes, uh, which is not terrifically pertinent to tonight. Um, but clinically I have practiced primary care, but over the past, oh, I don't know, seven years now, I've, I've really been starting and running various, um, what I call lifestyle medicine programs. So helping people change their diet and get healthier through diet and lifestyle changes. And, um, that's mostly been utilizing a plant-based diet, uh, a, a strict whole food plant-based diet. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at now. I'm doing a little research and, and I have a small practice online at myplantbasedprogram.com. Thank you. And I am Dr. Christy Funk. I am a surgical breast oncologist, so breast cancer surgeon. I finished my breast cancer fellowship at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles 20 years ago in 2002. And I stayed on at Cedar sinai as one of the directors of their breast center. Um, at the time was run by five men over 50. So they wanted some estrogen in there. And then my husband and I had the um, bright plans of creating this one-stop shop, like everything under one roof with cherry cloth robes and fresh flowers and making a breast center that was very inviting and marrying state-of-the-art technology and diagnostic techniques with compassionate, more holistic care, bringing in things like nutrition and Chinese medicine, physical therapy, et cetera. So we launched the Pink Lotus Breast Center in 2009, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Although the, the picture of the center has evolved over the last uh, 14 years and devolved because insurance didn't, doesn't always just honor the whole, <laughs> the whole aspect of, um, of more preventive and holistic care. And so financially it was challenging, not to mention that we opened doors. I kid you not, if you look at the Dow Jones graph, it is boom, 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 boom March 23rd, 2009. Look it up. The nadir of worldwide financial collapse was the day I opened doors. Um, and I was four months pregnant with triplets. So needless to say, the three surgeons who said they would come with me bailed and I had a $50,000 a month lease uh, for eight years. And that's a totally different story. Um, but uh, interestingly, part of that hardship that I endured led me to explore different things that I never would have otherwise. And one of those things, quite honestly, was writing my book, Breast the Owner's Manual. As I mentioned, I have three sons and they, at the time of writing the book, were six and a half, seven. They were seven most of that time that I was writing. And honestly, I never would have written a book if I didn't need the advance money so badly. I'm not kidding. So it really is the, the biggest blessing of my life. I, I had ideas for a book. I would do it when the boys were in college and didn't need me so much. Instead, I needed the money. I wrote it now and it has transformed me. So when I dove into the nutritional science, really for the first time, the other doctors on the panel will agree with me. I'm sure we get like Zippo in all of medical school and training on nutrition other than like the Krebs cycle. And I dove into this science blown away that it really existed in these peer-reviewed, reputable journals from New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, etc. It wasn't like in Green Leafy Magazine, kooky stuff. It was solid evidence. And I was really just 
beyond convinced by the evidence that a plant-based lifestyle um, and diet is the only way to go, the healthiest diet on the planet. And so I'm probably the newest on the panel to this way of living. It's been five years now straight, where if you heard my lecture yesterday, we went totally plant-based in one hour, um, emptied the fridge, and that was it. We never looked back. My three sons, my husband, who is a uh, not by profession, but just for fun, that he's a nationally ranked um, full Ironman distance Ironman, and he was totally on board. And um, anyway, I have been transformed by the writing in a way that I can now really empower women with some very actionable um, start right now power that they can embrace, and I can help them transform their lives in that pivotal diagnosis moment where look, if you do everything you've been doing up until this point, that let cancer happen. So we can't emerge out of this experience and journey, reverting back to the same thought patterns, diet patterns, lifestyle habits, because what's then to prevent a recurrence, just this tamoxifen pill you're on or whatnot. So I've been so blessed and empowered by this writing of the book um, that it's transformed my practice and my home life and my whole vision for my self and my future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bard? Yes, yeah, so my latest textbook came out in August and it was image guided diagnosis of COVID-19 lung disease because I've been working with telemedicine for um, 30 years and I hooked up with the Europeans with whom I, I do a lot of consulting and co-research. And because there are no patients coming into New York City into a private office imaging practice anywhere, uh, the uh, hospitals in Germany, France, uh, Italy were filled with people and telemedicine ultrasound connections. So I worked with them and we saw a better way to diagnose lung disease. And more importantly, we got into the whole post-COVID uh, imaging of the arteritis, you know, the, the, the stroke, uh, the vasculitis, the, the, the aneurysms, the um, neuropathy, all these things that happened. So, uh, and that, that was, a COVID book, but before that, I think in 2020, the textbook on, let's see, it was called Image Guided Dermatologic Treatment. Yeah, that was the latest one in 2020, because I'm a user of very high resolution ultra scan, uh, ultrasound with high resolution optical imaging, confocal microscopy, um, high field MRI, as indicated. So I've been interested in the skin for many, many years because I saw the dermatologist, number one, thought they could see below the skin and worse uh, because they couldn't see under the skin and because the, the biopsies were not that uh, informative, Take, you know, taking tissue out of people's scalp or skin and not coming to a, a real clear diagnosis bothered me a lot. So I wrote this book again with my uh, European and uh, international uh, co-authors. But the book I'd like to talk about was in 2005 because it described my first interaction with medicine and being almost killed by it. As a matter of fact, I would have been killed by it because I, I developed polio as a kid in 1949 and I was sent to a hospital to die. And I was doing not well, but not poorly. And then one day my health declined rapidly. So the doctors figured, look, the, the kid can't breathe well. Uh, he's probably developed pneumonia from lying in bed. And they called my parents up and said, you better come to see him. Well, fortunately, my dad <laughs> was an army physician. Uh, he was a surgeon in World War II. And he came back from the Pacific Theater of War with penicillin, which the doctors at this huge polio treatment center had never heard of, didn't believe, and told my father, you couldn't give it to your kid. So my father you know, smiled, agreed with them, 
And then he gave me these little pills. He said, take these white pills with a lot of water when nobody can see you. And a week later, I was 100% better with my breathing. So uh, I've had countless experiences where standard medical, shall we say, paradigms of teaching or thought or algorithms, however you want to call it these days, has, is doing more harm than good. And I think what you're all talking about in plant-based natural treatment is superb. This is the key because it's, it's healthy. And, and Tom, I'd like to say one more thing about diabetes and, and cancer and inflammatory skin disease because I work with uh, treatment technologies. My philosophy is if you can see a, a tumor or see a disease, uh, then if you can image it and look at the biology of the disease, then you can treat it better. My whole work was then and still is to validate new treatment options. So one of the new treatment options we are using with diabetes is a pulse electromagnetic field therapy, which is, this, this is came from, it's basically a German, uh, concoction that is used all over the world, except in the United States. In the US, they use it on dogs and horses, <laughs> racehorses, mostly, because it, it helps healing tissue and helps the, uh, the, the horses um, run faster and the dogs from limping. But it also has been used for diabetes treatment because it realigns the uh, molecular imaging of disease. And it helps the, the um, body to be well, be stronger. Now regarding natural best breast uh, healing, when I was at the John Wayne Cancer Institute in um, many years ago, uh, we were discussing melanoma treatment because I'm, my ultrasound technology finds melanoma better than any other uh, uh, diagnostic or even biopsy device in my opinion. We were talking about biopsying the breast or biopsying cancer in general. So, Christy, let me ask you if this is true. They made a statement then when they biopsy a woman's breast, the biopsy somehow, maybe it leaks uh, cancer cells, but people who get core biopsies have a shorter lifespan and more metastatic disease than people who get the whole area uh, cut out and then diagnosed. Is that something you agree with? Mm, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. I'm trying to be as naturalistic as possible to, uh, well, replace biopsies with imaging because this is what I do. And uh, certainly in the dermatologic area, the biopsies have proven very, very fully accurate for for the last 25 years, they've been really lousy. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bard. So uh, let me ask you the big question first, the number one question that would make everything else more interesting. When we speak to Dr. Caldwell Esselstein, he looks in the camera and says, you can become heart attack proof with diet and lifestyle. And this is exactly what everyone dreams of. He is literally saying the scariest number one cause of death, heart disease and strokes. He is using the term heart attack proof, which is so fantastic and gives us all so much of empowerment and feeling like we have control over our destiny. It's not just random. If we have a great diet and lifestyle, we could dramatically reduce or eliminate heart disease and stroke, which we love. The question is, what percent of cancer can we eliminate with diet and lifestyle? In other words, people are going to list, you know, watching this, this panel and they're thinking, well, if I can only eliminate 2%, it's not really worth finding out what to do. It's not enough. But if you can eliminate a lot, then there's a lot of motivation to figure out what those things are. So the question is, what percent of the cancer deaths in 2021 and could have been prevented with an ideal diet and lifestyle based on your research and personal experience? For, and all three of you can answer that question. Yeah, before I talk about the cancer uh, death experience, 
let's backtrack a little bit to the cardiovascular because I'm actually an example of diet and cardiovascular health. When I first learned to do arterial carotid ultrasound imaging in St. Louis at, at Washington Medical Center, I found to my surprise, we, we were all being students and we were scanning each other. I had a lot of plaque in my carotid artery, a lot. This was a surprise and unsuspected. So I did change my diet. And now when we scan my uh, carotid artery, there's maybe 1% uh, of, of uh, plaque left from something like 50%. So clearly diet, uh, healthy, healthy lifestyle can work on the, um, the, the coronary plaque and buildup. The other thing it may work on is the, for heart attacks, is the inflammatory component, which makes the plaque rupture. And this is, people are just really beginning to look at that. At the Inflammatory Disease Summit uh, in New York uh, in November, the, the concept between inflammatory, mostly skin disease and cancer was echoed by everybody internationally in the audience because chronic inflammation obviously uh, reduces our immune system and increases the likelihood of getting cancer. So I think that if your genetic system allows for it, I think uh, heart attacks can be greatly reduced and cancer can be greatly reduced too, but it depends upon your, uh, your immune by well, look your internal biology and immunology and and biochemistry as well as the external. So it's it's you can't give a percentage answer, but you can say it'll help and it will help more if you take out the external causes of cancer like uh, radiation and and uh, oh toxins. That's my other big thing because I work with the nine eleven uh, commission. And the other way is to develop a, just a healthier lifestyle. You can help yourself by helping uh, your diet. Thank you. I definitely um, would say yeah. that cancer rates with uh, embracing a plant-based lifestyle, uh, including then exercise, yeah. not smoking, minimizing alcohol would eliminate 80 to 90% of all breast cancer and all cancer on the planet. Wow. Tom, what's your number? <laughs> I, that's extraordinarily difficult to give a number. I would give a number that's lower than that, actually. Um, if, if you look back at uh, some of the early research, looking at um, observational studies across countries, you know, where, where countries were eating a very traditional plant-based diet, very much more simple uh, diets and having a lot more physical activity, and um, comparing these, doing these ecologic studies, which are kind of crude, um, but they, they're good for generating hypotheses, they're not proof. Um, and then you also look at some of the migrant studies, looking at people moving from low risk areas to high risk areas and stuff, uh, you know, in that, that vein of research. There is a report that came out in 1980 uh, by Sir Richard Dahl and Sir Richard Pito, two extraordinarily prominent um, researchers, uh, in part for their research on tobacco. And when they assessed the information, they thought that maybe about, you know, if you average things out, maybe about a third of cancer was due to tobacco. And maybe a third, 35% or so was due to diet, dietary factors. But the dietary factor component was a huge range. Like they, you know, there was not a good sense. It wasn't, it was kind of this um, more vague, more amorphous. So there, there were, they, they suggested there could be a range anywhere from 10% of cancers due to dietary factors up to 70% due to, due to dietary factors. And um, the, the problem is, you know, we're talking about Esselstyn and the way he presents it. The problem is that we don't have um, similar research in cancer. So there has been astonishingly little intervention research with cancer patients to see exactly what happens. So we're left with incomplete data and trying to uh, put things, you know, make our best guess. And um, it's going to be different. I think we're going to find it's going to be different, obviously, for different types of cancers. Um, I mean, some cancers are, are caused by viruses and uh, other cancers may be unrelated to diet. 
um, you know, certainly from that 1980 study, if you've put together, you know, not smoking and um, if you had the optimal dietary factors, uh, you, you get up to, you know, two thirds of, of cancers, perhaps. Um, uh, so it's two thirds, 70%. It's, it's hard. It's, it, it's really hard to know. And, um, you know, because we don't, we don't have the research and I think different cancers are going to be a little different, you know, different types of, um, you know, obviously different types of cancers are, are, are really quite different, um, can be very different, uh, etiologies. So, um, or causes. So, you know, I, I think that we, we have promise that there could be a, a good deal prevented, um, we don't necessarily know, though, how much could be uh, uh, prevented once it occurs, um, you know, the progression prevented once it occurs, uh, and we don't necessarily know the details of those. So it's, it's a, a little bit of a frustrating situation, but, it, but again, that background evidence suggests that diet and lifestyle probably matters a great deal. Thank you. Okay, um, I have a question for each of you. Um, for Dr. Bard, um, for men with, pro and I'll read all three first and then you can answer them after. Uh, for men with prostate cancer who follow watchful waiting, how well does it work? How well does watchful waiting work? In other words, doing nothing except focusing on high quality diet and lifestyle, but not actually doing any intervention. Um, for Dr. Funk, um, the question is, in your book, Breast, there's a chapter called Debun Debunking Breast Cancer Myths. Um, what are the myths? And for Dr. Campbell, um, since the China study came out, what have the follow-up studies shown? Do you feel as strong about your conclusions as you did when the book came out um, in the uh, 16, 17 years since then? Do you feel less strong, the same? You know, there's, it was a very monumental book that talked about two different, you know, two different outcomes in China, yet the people were all very similar and the main difference was their diet and lifestyle. It was very dramatic. Um, has this been duplicated? So if each, if each of you could answer your question, that would be great. Dr. Bard, you could start. Sure. Well, this has been partly studied again from the a World Trade Center attack in 2001 because the statistics of the first responders show that uh, although the first three cancers are uh, skin cancers, uh, prostate cancer is the fifth most common cancer. And once these guys get a diagnosis of cancer, especially the firefighters with whom I work with, uh, they're careful. They uh, drink less alcohol, they're careful. And most of their, I'd say, with lifestyle change, watchful waiting, I'd say 90% uh, of uh, low-grade cancer is, uh, it's been stable over the last uh, 20 years since we've been working with this group. And of course, I've been doing the, uh, the prostate imaging for, uh, I mean, for ever since 3D ultrasound came out in uh, 20, uh, 25, 30 years ago. So low-grade cancer, basically with managed with lifestyle is extremely benign disease. As a matter of fact, I, I caution patients that your chance of, of getting serious injury from a prostate biopsy is probably greater than uh, not doing anything uh, aggressive with the cancer. So, you know, watch it. And the point is we have a better way of watching it now. We do imaging with high resolution technology, which shows the location, aggression of the tumor, penetration through the, the capsule spread to the glands. So if it's sitting there and you can verify that it's, it's basically stable, I'd say we're talking 90, 95% of watchful waiting will work. Thank you. Dr. Funk? Okay, myths. Uh, yes, I have a whole chapter. Chapter two in the book is dedicated to myths. My favorite one to debunk is when patients say, well, you know, breast cancer doesn't run in my family, so I'm not at risk. Uh, yeah, the two biggest risk factors for getting breast cancer are being a woman and getting older. And only five to 10% of all breast cancer patients have an inherited genetic mutation like BRCA or CHECK2 that would predispose them to getting breast cancer. So that's a huge myth to debunk because it actually 
um, can lead to a saved life by women be paying more attention to their breasts if they literally think breast cancer ain't my thing just because it's not in their family history. Importantly, 87% of women diagnosed with breast cancer do not have a single first degree relative with breast cancer and around 80% don't have any relatives. So if you're a woman and you have breasts, you are at risk for breast cancer. Um, approximately one in eight, 12.8. 5% of women will get breast cancer, 12.8 when you look at the details. Um, and the risk only goes uh, up or down from there, depending on what diet and lifestyle choices you're making. Another fun myth to debunk because it's liberating is coffee. So it is true that the coffee can cause breast cysts and cause breast tenderness, but neither of those things is cancer. So if coffee doesn't hurt your breasts, it's actually, um, full of, there's mounting evidence that it's full of certain compounds, um, methylxanthines and other antioxidants that actually decrease breast cancer risk. Although I've seen a number of these studies and they always are five cups or more a day. So it's quite a lot of coffee <laughs> and that might not be good for um, uh, your heart rate. Another myth is bras, underwire bras um, do not have any association with breast cancer. Wearing bras has no association antiperspirants and deodorants. Um, and there's good cause for concern. You know, you think about the aluminum salts in these products and the armpit being so close to the lymphatic drainage basin of the breast. And these myths, uh, they um, are propagated and get some momentum because they do kind of make some sense. Like even the bra thing, like the wire in the bra may have some toxic effects, or maybe it's if it's too tight, you create lymphatic congestion and lymph, of course, contains the toxins that's supposed to travel out and maybe they leak into the breast. But it actually just doesn't follow through with the science when you really do the research on them. So that's another one. Uh, hair relaxers in African-American women do not have an association with breast cancer. Acidic uh, foods. So this is a of interest to me. Uh, alkaline water is kind of all the rage, but you have to realize that um, this kind of goes against basic physiology. First of all, whatever you swallow down goes into a complete acid bath of a pH 1.5 to 3.5. So that gets altered. Um, and your body tightly regulates your pH by making you pee out the imbalance, like between 6.8 and 7.8. And outside of that, you're dead. So this whole idea of like drinking alkaline is rooted in something smart. So again, like all these myths are perpetuated because of like an initial thing, like hmm, that makes sense. It is true that cancer flourishes in a more acidic and hypoxic environment. However, it creates its own little environment, that tumor micro environment, it makes its own acid right there where it's spinning in place. So drinking the alkaline stuff never actually makes it there to neutralize that situation. And just as a general truth, Plant-based foods are alkaline, whereas the meat and dairy products are more acidic. So if you are eating alkaline, you are eating a healthy diet that actually the diet itself and all the phytonutrients in those foods are decreasing your risk of cancer, not actually the alkaline state of said foods. Um, piercings and tattoos, body art um, has no association with cancer. I will say that tattoo, tattoos on your chest like whenever I do a sentinel node biopsy and I'm operating, I can literally see, like it dyes the node. So it does get in your body and seen microscopically by the pathologist all the time. Um, medical x-rays do have an association with breast cancer, but the like electromagnetic fields that you naturally um, are exposed to as you walk around or a cell phone or microwave, um, all of these um, non- um, ionizing radiation sources do not cause breast cancer. And um, finally, I'll go with abortions. Um, they do not have any association with breast cancer. There are some more fun ones. So I encourage you to get my book and read all about them. Thank you. So um, it's a difficult question. You know, I think to repeat your question, Steve, please jump in is, you know, how have, how ha has my view, view or my understanding changed since writing the China study, basically. And um, the China study, of course, the first third of that book is, um, is really my dad's research, his research career and his research journey. And I helped him write it and think about it and present it and organize it and that type of thing. But living the research 
doing the research and writing about it are two different things. So I would be remiss to say, you know, that was it, 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 my experience, right, from that book. But I think when I talk to people about the China studies, China study, one of the things that um, that comes up sometimes is that people have, uh, you know, a, a maybe an overly simplistic understanding uh, of, of the book, and that is that you know, a- animal protein causes cancer, and it's proven. And you know, my dad had an extensive um, animal uh, uh, laboratory and and research and looked at it in great detail. And um, I think when you look at the totality of evidence, I think what we were saying more th- with more evidence, more weight was that diets pro- with predominant, uh, with high levels of animal protein, dietary patterns with high levels of animal protein, um, and also with more processed food is unhealthy. So, you know, I, I think if you, um, I mean, it would be great to, to talk about this with my dad at the same time, but um, you know, I think, I think he would agree with that. And we've talked about this many times that it's not as simple as saying, you know, that study showed animal protein causes all cancer. Um, and, uh, so, so moving on from that basic understanding, uh, you know, clearing up that sort of initial understanding was that plant predominant diets, um, uh, potentially can, ha- can have a dramatic effect on cancer and, and in animal research, even affect progression of cancer. Um, you know, I, I don't think from there over the, uh, over the next, uh, however long it's been 16, 17 years since the books come out, I don't think my view has changed. I mean, I think the research has supported that uh, by and large um, and that, you know, more plant predominant diets, more whole food diets, if there's an effect of nutrition, it's often uh, positive you know, what strikes me is the lack of research, really. I mean, as I've, as I went from a, working with my dad and nutrition and communicating about nutrition, then to filling in the medical uh, background and then getting into research myself, it's astonishing to me how many years, decades, centuries even, that, um, you know, the idea of, of looking at dietary treatment of cancer has been brought up as a, as a prospect and how uh, little has been done. So, you know, since the China study has been uh, done, Dean Ornish did a randomized controlled trial on early stage prostate cancer, um, you know, but there, there's been precious few uh, in, in supporting this idea of, of plant-based diets actually uh, potentially affecting progression and, and, and being a, a treatment, um, uh, one, one uh, treatment um, approach. And, uh, you know, uh, other than that, unfortunately, there haven't been too many intervention studies. So, um, you know, we're working on it, but that's kind of really what we need. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question for each of you. Um, Dr. Bard, um, I don't know if our audience fully understands this, so let me just explain. All over the United States, people get medical imaging um, to check, to see inside their bodies. And the standard, there's a bunch of standard types, and those types um, are effective, but the concern of some of us, whether it's um, an accurate concern or not, is that we're getting exposed to radiation. Now, how much of a concern that should be, I'm not sure. I'm just, you know, that's the general concern. You, on the other hand, appear to be possibly, if I understand this, the only one in the country that has a different type of um, imaging device that you believe is as or more effective and doesn't have the radiation. So could you please explain what you do, what's different about it, and uh, why no one else seems to have this? Um, Dr. Funk, if you could also comment on mammograms. Uh, I understand that mammograms are the standard and that's what is recommended everywhere. We had a speaker who passed away named Ben Johnson who wrote once wrote a book on no mammograms. Um, and again, I guess the concern was the radiation. So it would be great if you could share with us um, if you recommend mammograms, how often, and if you have a concern, some people say to get thermographies. So if you could give us your input on that. And then Dr. Campbell, uh, and I'd appreciate if when you answer the question, if you'd repeat the question before you answer it, uh, that would be great. And Dr. Campbell, um, at our conference, we have 
kind of two types of whole food plant-based people. We have people saying, whatever you do, do not add fat to your diet. Definitely no oils and minimum on the nuts, seeds, um, avocados, and olives. And then we have another group saying, um, that's not right. You want to have fat in your diet and olives and nuts and seeds and avocados are great and oils are okay also. So uh, within the whole food plant-based world, what is your thought on raw plant-based fats? And um, if Dr. Funk, if you want to comment on that one also, that would be great as well. So uh, Dr. Bard, if you could repeat my question and then answer it, that would be great. The hazards of medical imaging, especially radiation-induced cancer. Uh, this is a very interesting area because there are different types of medical imaging devices. I use ultrasound because it's basically, um, it, it's completely safe unless, when I gave a fellow a great report on his prostate, it wasn't cancer, and he jumped off the table and he sprained his ankle. So it, it's not true for everybody that it's completely uh, hazard free. However, when you do CT exams, first of all, CT has got a lot of radiation, it's important, but what's a real problem is the, the contrast with CT. It can cause uh, kidney disease and arterial inflamation, plus uh, the, the, there's a toxicity to it. We're even finding out with the MRI contrast that we use for all the, the brain and, and prostate and even, even breast imaging that uh, the gadolinium winds up in the brain and is uh, potentially toxic. I've even had some patients who have had severe allergic reactions to gadolinium contrast, which was supposedly safe, but word of mouth is stronger than uh, statistics because I've had quite a few people who refuse now to get the, the MRI gadolinium from serious side effects. So back to, back to imaging. The Ultrasound technology we use is 3D, and this was developed in Germany some 30, 35 years ago, and it was first used on the, well, on the shoulder and on, on pregnant babies, you know, to see, to see the fetus and the, and the, 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 the fingers and uh, the penis of the baby, because the accuracy is now so great with the... 3D real-time imaging that we are doing now heart surgery in utero inside the pregnant mother uh, while the baby's uh, floating around. Same thing with brain surgery. We're, we're injecting chemicals and doing, say, getting rid of clots or aneurysms that are forming inside the uh, fetal and neobradal natal brain. With regard to mammography, I have, I have started with the a, a dense breast practice from years ago. I worked with Dr. Henry Lees, who wrote many of the textbooks on mammography almost a hundred years ago now, and worked with, let's see, Dr. Let's see, this is um, from Mount Sinai. This is the fellow who developed the lumpectomy at Mount Sinai 60 years ago. And he was my partner in my office. And all these people had dense breasts. And of course, if you have dense breasts, you have increased risk of, of cancer from 400% to 700%, according to the latest literature. That being said, Mammography is important to show calcification. It's extremely good at that for screening. The problem with microcalcification or suspicious looking calcium in the breast, uh, two things happen. When tumors are dying, sometimes they cause dystrophic or uh, the dead cells accumulate calcium. And even though they're not active cancer cells, they look like potential cancer on the X-ray. A huge study out on the island 
Long Island, where it's, it's loaded with toxins from factories, was that 95% of mammography suspicious cancer after being biopsied were not cancer. It was something else. What I do in my personal breast practice is if somebody's got dense breasts and we have very good imaging with our non-invasive ultrasound is I do get a mammogram, but I get a limited view of it, say one x-ray on each side, as opposed to 10 x-rays on, on five sides because you don't image it well. And if there's no suspicious microcalcium, we do the limited mammogram, say every year or every other year. Also, my practice has got a lot of young patients. We're working with um, the, the health community, the athletic community. As a matter of fact, the leader of one of our, our studies is a woman's uh, triathlete. Uh, she's uh, one of the iron women. And she is doing a study with us on low body mass female athletes and breast cancer because number one, they've got small breasts in general. And number two, they're also young and very dense. So we're trying to get away from mammography as much as possible, unless it's really clinically indicated. And then to see that there's not something else better. Now in the past uh, year, ultrasound technology has even made further leaps and bounds in breast imaging. We have almost microscopic imaging now in uh, 3D technology that's being developed in the, in the Silicon Valley area. So we have extraordinary accurate ways of looking at things. So I still recommend mammography as a primary screening tool in general, but we have to temper it with what's, is there a better way? Is there a more accurate way with less risk, less downside? Yeah, I, I agree. So to hop on here and continue the MAMO talk, um, my first question was, was what, what are the um, risks in terms of causing breast cancer? So, you know, patients often decline mammography, they, they're fearful of radiation, the exposure might cause a breast cancer. And I tell them, yeah, you're right. And so the, uh, the data shows that if you get a lifetime's worth of mammograms, say every year from 40 to 80 years old, if you take 10,000 women, this radiation exposure annually will cause 8.6 cancers and will have found 860 cancers. So in other words, <laughs> Routine mammography finds a hundred times more cancer than it causes, but the radiation exposure will cause a cancer in about one out of every 1160 women who get screened annually. So I'd like to just put that in a little bit of context too, because, you know, like rads don't really mean anything to the average person. So every seven weeks, just walking around earth from cosmic radiation and uh, radioactive materials, naturally just ex getting uh, your body as you move through the world. Um, every seven weeks, you get the equivalent of a mammogram um, by comparison to other ionizing radiation in medicine at one whole body PET CT is 62 mammograms worth of radiation. One CT angiogram looking at your coronary arteries will be 30 mammograms. Uh, one chest CT will be 17 and a half mammograms and one chest x-ray will be four mammograms. So what do I recommend? For average risk women, I side with the American Society of Breast Surgeons and advise getting mammography every year beginning at age 40 and not stopping or skipping years until you plan to die in the next 10 years, which is admittedly hard to plan. But um, you know what I mean? If you've got like end stage cardiac disease on oxygen and a wheelchair, you can probably stop your mammograms because the breast cancer detected would not actually end your life. So that's another issue though, is the real question with mammography is how many lives are saved by screening for every life lost because of the radiation induced breast cancer? 
from the mammograms, right? And uh, the, there are only computerized models looking at the answer to this question. And there was one great good risk model from England recently published that said 312. You save 312 lives for every one lost from the radiation exposure. Another American model said less than that. It was 60 lives saved for every one lost. What about thermography? It's such a sexy, cool idea that you could analyze heat patterns, right? Because of angiogenesis, because tumors always bring more blood flow to them uh, in order to exist and get their nutrients and proliferate and then ultimately escape. There is heat associated with that blood flow. So wherever heat is congregating on a thermogram, there very well may be a cancer there as opposed to the background general blood flow through the breast tissue. The problem I've encountered over 20 years now of chasing down psychedelic looking swirls of heat on thermograms is that I haven't really seen it work reliably. I've seen it miss like 10 centimeter cancers simply because the background blood flow is so big. The kids are so big that it like all just blended. I've seen it miss cancer and I've seen it call things like super hot, like this is gonna be cancer. And then it's just not. And it leaves this whole window of uncertainty for the lady because nothing can find it. And yet she's certain. So you can't do a thermogram guided biopsy. And in my opinion, that's a problem. Dr. Bard might just have you excise that area. We can talk about that. It's not a wrong concept. You do shower tumor into the bloodstream, by the way, when you biopsy it. Um, but it's, it's already showering itself all day long. We can talk about that if you want. It's not this question. My point is that thermograms really don't replace anything. Because once you find a hot spot, guess what you're doing? The stuff you didn't want to do. Mammogram, MRI, breast ultrasound, and maybe a biopsy. So new technology has to do something better than the existing status quo. And it has to generally do it at the same price or cheaper, right? Um, and then there's the whole question of overdiagnosis, where you're diagnosing these two, three millimeter tumors. Like that sounds like, wow, that's super early and how great. But now you're running the risk of over-treating a woman. Lumpectomy, radiation, chemo, anti-estrogen pills, maybe even doing mastectomies over this like little speck of alteration in her breast. So that's a, that's a mixed bag. Um, what we really need is better understanding of biology, of genomics of cancer, um, in addition to early detection. And the final question you asked me, Steve, was there an, uh, another one? Mammographies, thermographies. I don't, I don't know if there was another one. Was okay, there? we're good. We're on to Dr. Campbell and okay. fact. So I think the question for me was about whole food, whole food plant-based diets, um, inclusive of fats and natural fats and um, uh, high fat foods and whole food plant-based diets without those things, right? You mentioned raw too, um, but that's a slightly separate, slightly separate issue. I'm happy to talk about that. But um, it, so if you uh, look at the uh, cancer literature, it would be very hard to say, you know, that um, a whole food plant-based diet with higher fat content versus a whole food plant-based diet with lower fat, fat content does X. You know, we, we just, there is no firm research comparing those things and its effect on cancer. So we're left with indirect research. And I'll tell you uh, my take on the indirect research. Um, one is, um, and this is going to go maybe a little against my last answer, which is, you know, there's been a, a dearth of research looking at diet and cancer, and there has been, but there, I'm thinking there have been a couple large um, trials that were done looking at early stage breast cancer and, and, and giving them um, fruits and vegetables or uh, having uh, women adopt a low fat diet. And uh, these were done in the early, in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. And uh, one of those studies uh, found that if the fat intake, uh, the, the low fat one that actually got fat intake down fairly low for a little while, um, not terrifically different. Now, these, these women weren't totally changing their dietary patterns. It was totally focused on fat. So 
baked chicken instead of fried chicken, low fat dairy instead of full fat dairy, this type of thing. So this was not a test of plant-based diets, but what they showed was that with a lower fat diet that um, there was a reduction in risk of uh, breast cancer uh, recurrence uh, after being treated for early stage. So there's like a quarter, 25% uh, reduction in risk um, with, a, with this low fat diet. And um, there is another uh, follow-up analysis of the Women's Health Initiative that, that showed that, again, studied low fat diets that showed that women adopting a low fat diet had a, uh, who got breast cancer were at slightly lower risk of dying from that breast cancer. So there's a little bit out there supporting um, low fat in terms of uh, breast cancer and dietary treatment. But the thing that's probably more compelling to me is the effect uh, on body weight. So we know that body weight and excess body weight is a risk factor for uh, several cancers, some of our biggies, including postmenopausal breast cancer. And um, in my experience working with folks, um, you know, the, most, most of us in America need to uh, shed some pounds and lose some, lose some excess weight and we'd be healthier. And uh, based on a lot of indirect research, that certainly may reduce our cancer risks um, to, to uh, achieve a healthy weight or get closer to a healthy weight. And in my experience on plant-based diets, um, if you switch to a whole food plant-based diet, what I oftentimes see is that people get benefit and pretty significant benefit, but those people with significant excess weight may hit a plateau uh, before they get what I would consider probably the maximal benefit. And we kind of go through food diaries and go through things. And, you know, if you go online and look at plant-based uh, websites and plant-based recipes, you find a million recipes where there's cashews, a cup of cashews in, in every cup of cashew sauce, um, you know, walnut sauce, uh, and similarly, um, you know, desserts with a lot of dates. And um, so you can have foods that are actually very high fat um, and very high sugar uh, as well on a whole food plant-based diet. And they taste delicious. They're very rich. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the food you used to love. And, and um, you know, and, and, and you're not going to, um, you're not going to reduce your calorie intake in my experience. So they're too easy to overeat. So, um, you're not necessarily going to get to your, to your maximal, uh, I think metabolic health, um, incorporating significant amounts of high fat, uh, plant foods. So, um, based on some of the research on diet and cancer, I would suggest, uh, low fat is better. Um, and it particularly dietary change in low fat enough to lose weight. Um, and then to that end, uh, for that reason, I think, um, you know, a, a lower fat whole food plant-based diet is likely to be better. Thank you. Okay. Three new questions. Uh, question one for Dr. Bard and Dr. Funk is, um, there are some people that say biopsies um, open up whatever they're biopsying and spread, spread cancer. Um, maybe not mainstream medical doctors might not be saying this, but some alternative type people are saying, be careful with a biopsy because you could spread the cancer. So I'd like to get your opinions on that. That's question one. Question two for Dr. Funk, um, do, are there some scenarios where you recommend to a healthy woman to remove her breast due to genetics and um, ri other risk factors that make you think it makes sense. And question three um, for uh, Dr. Campbell, um, do you have any opinion um, on whether one sugar feeds cancer and then does fruit feed cancer? Because there are some people like Brian Clement at Hippocrates Health Institute that says sugar, fruit, has sugar, which feeds yeast, mold, fungus, candida, cancer. And he says that Thomas Seyfried from Boston College says this also, or says that, uh, says something that supports this. He doesn't exactly say this. So the question is, does fruit, does sugar cause cancer? And then does fruit, which most people are saying is wonderful, does fruit itself feed yeast, mold, fungus, candida, cancer, and possibly be a problem because it has sugar in it. So if you could try to repeat the question before you answer it, I'd like to hear from all three of you. 
Sure. So does biopsy spread cancer? Let's let's uh, take a different peek at at what we're looking at. First of all, who looks at the biopsy? It's a pathologist. If you're going to give a biopsy, say the size of a golf ball, say under the arm or in the breast to a pathologist, he is going to look at certain areas and he cannot find the micro metastatic foci, foci unless he's been directed to it. The imaging technology we have been working with now has two millimeter um, detection of, of cancer foci. So this is one of the things we do. Let's take the, the um, sentinel node biopsy that Christy recommended before. Well, it's very good in Europe, for example, if you don't see any, um, if somebody's got a suspicious biopsy, uh, lymph node on the arm, what we do is we image it, first of all, to see if it's abnormal or not abnormal. And secondly, if there is an abnormality, we we've, we've are able to, to detect two millimeter uh, lymph node metastases now, and uh, we, we're doing needle biopsies on them and getting cellular material. So frankly, some places are, are basically, well, uh, okay, let me re rewind. Who reads it, how they're doing the biopsy. So the overall thing is you do the imaging on the area as best you can to see what part of the tumor is a true cancer. And then what part of the tumor is inflammatory cellular content going in. What part of the tumor is scar formation within the tumor? And the last part would be immunologic cellular inflammation products in the tumor. So you have really th three components of a mass, only one of which may be the true aggressive cancer. And again, that's the word, is it aggressive or not? Christy said, you're finding, we're finding two millimeter tumors in a woman's breast. Why, you know, why cut something out two millimeters plus when you do that, you're leaving a scar and it's very hard to look at a mammogram after a scar is formed. It makes it, it's really hard to interpret. And I find that especially true in the skin cancer arena because almost everybody that comes in referred to me for skin cancer has been biopsied. I come in, when I see patients, I look at their skin, their face, and if it looks like a basal cell on their, on their nose or on their ear, or a squamous cell on their, um, you know, neck. We we do the imaging before the biopsy, and then I tell the the uh, surgeon what to look for, where to look for it, where it's most accurate. So you, who is who is reading the biopsy rather than how are you doing it? That's that that's really critical. We've given this technology at Mount Sinai to the um, pathology department how to do micro dissection with imaging before you, before you start cutting things up. Also remember that a image of, especially of a prostate cancer can look like a horrible cancer, but the tumor cells, as bad as they look can be physiologically inactive. That's why we do the, the biologic study. We did the vascular imaging, the, the blood flow study, the, uh, or, or blood flow, the, the Doppler study with ultrasound or with uh, all the, the MRI and um, let's see, the, the MRI contrast studies that really show real-time biology as opposed to tumor cells, which may or may not be inactive. So it's, it's, it's a very good question to, to uh, look at. And from the medical communities I've been to, the internists worry about the cells being spread and the surgeons do not, then the patients really, um, you, you've got no choice in getting it done to find out what it is. So we, we need to look at this problem more. 
Yeah, so I'll chime in to say there's two issues with, with biopsies and spread. So the first one is that you have a cancerous mass here, right? You take a needle and you poke it and you're dragging that needle out of the track. So seeding of the track with malignant cells studies show occurs one third of the time. Um, first of all, 80 plus percent of biopsies are of benign things. So who cares if you seed some benign cells out? In the cancer ones though that track, um, they are pulled out and dragged out. So they're divorced from their blood supply, their angiogenesis, their nutrients. And studies show that if you do a lumpectomy and margins that include that tract, a week after the uh, biopsy or a month after the biopsy or two months after the biopsy, the quantity of cells that are in that tract and dead goes up and up. So just the passage of time, because the cells didn't come with their little suitcases packed full of all the food they needed, they just die in the tract. For those that don't die, seeding a tract recurrence is exceedingly rare. There was a study out of Australia that looked at exactly that. Um, and they said, it, you know, it happens extremely rarely. Now, if it's cancer, most people, if they accepted the biopsy, are the type of people that are also going to have surgery. So it should just be cut out. And if they have a lumpectomy and there's a little tract cell left behind that just happens to get enough blood supply to live, that person probably was going to have radiation. So you can nuke the tract or they take tamoxifen a pill and then the anti-estrogen effect also makes the cell die. So there's very little concern for a malignant recurrence due to having done a biopsy in the breast. The other concern one might have and should have is, okay, does this biopsy push the cells that were contained in that little walnut of a tumor and push it into the lymphatic so it went to the lymph nodes whereas before it wasn't in the nodes or did it push it right into the bloodstream and off it went? Um, you should start the analysis of that by knowing this. Um, some studies funded by the NIH back in the 70s showed that if you graft a breast, human breast cancer onto a mouse that's the size of like a one centimeter sugar cube worth of cancer, sheds 3.2 million cells into the bloodstream every 24 hours. So you could argue like, nah, what's another 10,000 with my biopsy <laughs> pushed out? It's like the job of an intact, efficient immune system. And with one pass through, the body and the liver and all these uh, foreign body fighting stations in the nodes, these showered cells don't take root and cause metastases in the majority of women, obviously, right? Because otherwise everybody at the moment of breast cancer diagnosis should be metastatic and they clearly aren't. Um, so the body is doing some cleanup action out there. So the biopsy that might shower some cells in studies doesn't seem to impact overall survival. There was a study looking at, um, this was an Austrian review of 1,890 patients. They had breast cancer, underwent surgery, and then they had a sentinel node biopsy, whereas, which is where you take out, everybody varies like 30 to 50 nodes in the armpit, really, unless it's obvious there's tumor in them. We just care about the one or two that first get that lymph drainage from the breast. It's like the guard of the armpit, and that's why it's called the sentinel. So the sentinel node biopsy, they concluded that a preoperative biopsy, a core biopsy, stabbing the tumor, uh, does not cause artificial spread to the nodes, but there are other studies that show the opposite, that in fact biopsy does cause transport of cells. Again, um, their ultimate conclusion is that the cell's behavior in that node doesn't impact survival, and it might be because of what I explained before, like they're, they're pushed there. They didn't actually travel and metastasize there with all the things they needed intact to then create a bigger problem. And then finally, I'd just like to point out the logistics. I mean, if, if we are able to evolve with Dr. Bard's study technologies where imaging can give you a benign or malignant yes or no, then what I'm about to say is irrelevant. But if you every time you have a mass, remember 80 plus percent of biopsies are benign. And therefore you get to avoid going to an operating room, having an incision, anesthesia, a scar, maybe a cosmetic, like it goes on and on. And um, with the downsides of doing an open biopsy, there was a study in 2008 in Florida that they had a really high open biopsy rate of 30%, which is very high because we usually do these cores. And that led in just one year in that one state, it led to $112 million in payments for these open biopsies that we 
generally do by these you know, core biopsies. And if you extrapolate that data to the millions of biopsies done in the world, you're talking about trillions of dollars and that's just the money part. So um, I'm pro biopsy. Thank you. Also, I had asked about breast removal. Is there ever a case when you oh, do yeah. that? Oh, definitely. So prophylactic mastectomy, it's very individualized to the uh, story of given woman is living. So if you have say a BRCA1 gene mutation, your personal risk of breast cancer, depending on your current age, like if you're 30 years old, your lifetime risk of breast cancer can approach 87%. And that, that, that threat and the fact that 87 can become essentially zero um, with prophylactic mastectomy warrants a conversation about that. Um, there are other gene mutations where the risk of cancer is not so astoundingly high and we might just choose higher risk surveillance. So instead of like a mammo a year and you're done, you see me twice a year for a hands-on exam. We do screening ultrasounds and mammogram and an MRI. Speaking to Dr. Bard's gadolinium pooling in the brain um, concern, I have a very deep concern about that and um, really space the MRIs out to be usually every two to three years, depending on the risk level. But for sure, Prophylactic, meaning no cancer is known to be in the breast. Prophylactic mastectomy is uh, a discussion and a thing I do often um, because there are a lot of high risk situations out there that lead women to a more um, confident life. Like they're like, you know what? I hear all these stats and I just, I know surveillance is an option, but I don't want to show up. I don't want to show up for the mammogram and the ultrasound and a biopsy every time there's a blip on the radar because I'm higher risk. Like I just want to have total peace of mind. I feel like, you know, I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop. Oh, now I have invasive cancer. See, I should have done the prophylactic mastectomy. Is, so. is breast cancer a concern for women who have very small breasts or almost no breasts? Is it much, is it yeah. less risk? That's another myth, it's in the myth. So uh, small breasted women indeed have the exact same risk of breast cancer um, as larger breast women, breasted women. Uh, by and large, large breasts have a lot of fat, fat and stroma and things that don't actually make breast cancer. Um, so is small, thinner women have denser breast tissue and as Dr. Bark accurately mentioned, they have a higher risk of breast cancer simply due to that density, it's because what makes a breast dense is the stuff that makes the cancer, the milk producing lobules and the tiny little ducks. So no, I know they feel like doubly unlucky if they were wanting bigger breasts. They're like, I am flat chested and I don't get a reduction in breast cancer risk. No, you don't. Are you saying they have a higher risk? Uh, so if they are small breasted and very dense, so we grade density A through D. Um, only 10% of women are D and only 10% of women are A. So the vast majority, 80% are in the middle range of B and C. So when you compare the D densest people to the A's, the fattiest people, then you have four to six times the elevation in risk. So like a three to 500% increase in risk, but it's just the densest compared to the fattiest. Most women are in the middle. So it's not it's not all dense women because the sea level women is like 40% of people. So I, they, I, have I, a little, they can have a higher risk. Now to offset that, your tiny breasted women tend to be um, ideal body weight. So they're in a normal body mass index. They tend to be um, more athletic. So they offset some of the increased risk by the density by having a healthier lifestyle. Sorry for not listening carefully, but I want, so you want ideally low density or high density breasts, which is better for cancer prevention? Low density. So you, want low, you want low density. Yep. And could any woman find this out by going to her doctor? No, technically the only way to know if you're dense breasted or not would be the visual interpretation of a mammogram uh, on how much like white splotchy stuff there is because density appears white and fat appears black. But you, I mean, with enough experience, right, Dr. Bard, like I can tell density on an ultrasound, but the, the rule is it's read by a man. Well, let me respond to that because I'm also a medical advisor to the Are You Dense uh, Foundation. And I've been disturbed by the fact that mammograms, depending upon the compression and the 
the uh, X-ray strength can show wildly different amounts of, uh, of density. So we've developed a, a 3D ultrasound technology that quantifies the breast density. So it's, it's, it, this deserves further discussion because I agree with you that, that you have to have a general overview marker of visual, it's, there's got to be a better way of quantifying breast density because you're, you're giving advice to women on, on, their, on their, their risk based on it. So maybe we can find, if not ultrasound, maybe there'll be another uh, technology like um, spectral imaging of breast tissue or, or uh, sonic imaging. There are a lot of new technologies that are, are going through the breast now. Be interesting um, opportunity. Thank you. And for something totally different, <laughs> does sugar feed cancer? Um, so the question was, does sugar feed cancer? And, and then uh, the corollary, the secondary follow-up is, does fruit cause cancer? And, um, you know, I, I don't like the idea of sugar feeding cancer as, as a, uh, a popular idea. And the reason is that your whole dietary pattern matters a lot more than just saying sugar feeds cancer, because if you think that it's just sugar feeding cancer, you, you might skip the uh, chocolate bar, which is great, fine, but then have the McDonald's burger. And, you know, um, this idea that cancer cells, uh, you know, gobble up more sugar than other normal cells. Okay, fine. But, but nutrition, the food you eat and the nutrients in your body and how they get there and how they interact, there is a lot of steps in there. And there is a lot of interactions between different nutrients that happen. And we know cancer cells respond not just to sugar and the, and the fuel, but they respond to hormones. They respond to um, sex hormones. Uh, they respond to growth factors like IGF-1. Uh, they respond to insulin and insul you know, whether you're sensitive to insulin, insulin sensitivity, you know, just like your normal cells do. And we know that when these metabolic problems happen, that that can also affect rest, risk for, for cancer. So the idea that um, you know, it's just sugar feeding cancer is way too simplistic. I'm not a fan of uh, a lot of, obviously uh, a lot of sugar in a diet, um, but I, I, think, I think people really need to focus on the whole dietary pattern and, and focus more on whole food plant-based rather than thinking it's just sugar is, is sort of the magical um, you know, evil, evil thing. I think that's, that's way too simplistic. Um, and does fruit cause cancer? I, I will just respond kind of with a simple, simply saying, I, I don't think so. No, I, I, I would disagree <laughs> in saying that um, fruit causes uh, cancer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next three questions. Um, uh, Dr. Bard, uh, question for you is, why don't other doctors use this method for imaging if 3D ultrasonographic volumetric Doppler imaging um, is this unique special way to get uh, great imaging with less risk? Um, why is this not more of a standard or more used by lots more people? Why do you have to go to, you know, just to, to you, why is, why, is so, why is no one using it? I, I, I understand. Uh, Dr. Funk, um, do you recommend hormone replacement therapy? Do you recommend bioidentical hormone therapy? Uh, those two questions for you. And then uh, Dr. Campbell, um, what's wrong with eating fish? It seems like we've been eating it for thousands of years. What, what's the big deal with fish? So if each of you could answer those questions, repeat the question and then answer it, that would be great. Sure, so 3D ultrasound uh, use in America is limited basically in the prostate to my practice in, in the United States and Canada, nobody else is doing it. Because I get people from, uh, I have somebody coming up from Saskatchewan on Tuesday to see me and all my LA patients complain about the air travel and the jet lag. Uh, okay, how did I get into this? First of all, being a breast imager, I, when I saw that mammograms didn't work too well and that ultrasound also didn't work as well as we hoped. I flew over to Hammersmith Hospital in London. I spent some time with uh, Dr. Cosgrove, who's the world's expert on 3D imaging and uh, what else do they do in Europe? They do 
contrast enhanced ultrasound and they also do uh, elastography. That's the big thing in Europe. So it's, it's not being done here because we don't teach it. We don't know about it. We don't ask about it. The same thing, I had to go over to, um, to France to learn uh, skin cancer imaging and uh, to also to France and to Germany to uh, learn uh, 3D Doppler ultrasound imaging because my, my equipment is, the instructions to my equipment are in German. So I went there, I learned it, I came back, I got yelled at and I still get yelled at, but um, the patients understand it because when I, I show them their cancers visually on the screen as I'm doing the exam, I put my finger in and I feel the tumor, you know, breast prostate or, or a lump under the skin. Then I image it with regular ultrasound, then we do the 3D ultrasound, then we do the Doppler ultrasound. Now, because the technology is very expensive and learning curve for 3D is not so simple, it's uh, the, the people, more people should be doing this because I can scan a whole thyroid volume in 15 seconds with a 3D probe on each side. It gets the, the whole thing at once. It's an electronic scanner. It shows everything for the regular ultrasound image. And because you have the probe fixed on the skin, the next time you put back the probe in the same area, you can repeat the image for comparison when you're waving the wand over the skin back and forth, up and down, side to side. And then you have to go over it the same way uh, six months or a year later to follow up it may not be the same technology or the same settings on the equipment. So look, it's advanced and if people want to learn how to do it, I, I teach this. The first fellow who came in was in 1990. He came into my office. I taught him how to do prostate imaging with 3D ultrasound with, with uh, at that point it was 1.5 Tesla MRI with contrast and he thanked me very much. And after a couple of months, he opened up his own practice uh, in, in Australia. But he, I, I, I commute with him. I'm, if you look at coastal imaging in Australia, you can see I'm one of their overreaders when it comes to complicated cases. So yeah, if people want to learn, they will. But frankly, the spirit has gone out of a lot of medicine today, especially with the, the insurance companies and the, the politics of medicine. Thank you. Okay, my question was about hormone replacement therapy and what about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Okay, so there's no doubt that 80% of all breast cancers are fed and fueled by estrogen. So when you take hormone replacement therapy after the natural cyclical monthly cycles have disappeared, national average 51 and 10 months old, you are now prolonging your breast cells exposure to estrogen. And so how much cancer are we talking about? There are a number of studies looking at this. They always show an increase in cancer when you combine estrogen with progesterone. So the biggest one, the most famous one um, was the Women's Health Initiative. It was published in July, 2002. It followed 16,000 pre-menopausal, uh, post-menopausal women on Prempro, which is your typical <laughs> drug made out of uh, horse urine, and it's estrogen plus progesterone versus placebo. And they had to halt the study for ethical reasons early at 5.2 years because they clearly saw a 26% increase in breast cancer in the Prempro group. And that also was accompanied by uh, an increase in blood clots, dementia, um, dementia and um, heart attacks, but there was a decrease in colon cancer and hip fractures. So the hormones were protective against that. So here's what's so interesting. The very next year, 2003, the breast cancer rates in the US plummeted by 6.7%. I mean, never ever has there ever been anything to drop breast cancer uh, incidence rates besides COVID because people weren't going to get their mammograms. Um, so in that group that had a decrease, it was largely postmenopausal estrogen-driven cancers. And 
that is because of the results of that study, 33 million prescriptions like disappeared <laughs> over the next year because of the fears of it causing breast cancer. So then more recently in 2019, um, by the way, what that easy uh, numbers to wrap your mind around because that's like 26% is vague. So for every 143 women on the PremPro, one got a breast cancer she would not have already had, which doesn't sound like much, but when you extrapolate that out to the now 6.7 million um, women who are on HRT and then another about 8 million on B bioidentical HRT, that's like 41,000 invasive cancers a year that don't have to happen because women are on hormones. So I was gonna tell you the um, more, there was a good recent study in 2019 coming out of the UK and they mixed it up. So if you were on both estrogen and progesterone, it caused in just five years time, it caused one breast cancer out of every 50 women. So even higher risk. If you had estrogen plus intermittent progesterone, it was one out of every 70 women. And then estrogen alone, was one out of 200. So it's definitely always associated, even estrogen alone. And you may have investigated this enough and you're like, wait a minute, what about WHI? It had an estrogen only arm and it was kind of um, sneaky. You have to really look at the details of it because the headline you'll see back day, then that day in the news was that estrogen only yielded a 23% decrease in breast cancer. Yeah, but only if you started it five years after being menopausal, which hello, I've already hot flashed my way to a divorce in those first like first five years when you need it, and not if you took it for 10 or more years. So really it was just this little window that begins five years after menopause and it can't go on for more than 10 years that you actually get a protective effect. Um, and that isn't always reproduced. So as in the UK study, I just told you estrogen alone was one in 200. Okay, so you're getting the sense that I'm not a huge fan of hormone replacement. I'm not, particularly when you're already at high risk for breast cancer from a biopsy with a marker lesion, like a precursor to breast cancer type of biopsy, um, atypical papillomas, lobular carcinoma in situ. These are things that lead to a higher risk and you probably should definitely shy away from hormone replacement. Strong family history, a genetic mutation. The other thing is, why are, you, why are you on it? Why do you want to take it, right? So if it's because you heard, because there are counter studies that HRT, hormone replacement, was protective against heart attacks and your mom died at 54 years old from a heart attack, so you, that's why you want to take it? Hmm, jury's kind of out on the heart and hormone replacement connection. It goes both directions in studies. There's no real conclusion. And there's subsets of people in whom it helps and then in others, it hurts. Um, so it gets really complicated really fast. You'd have to talk to a knowledgeable doctor and make a very individualized decision about whether or not to take hormone replacement. Um, in particular, answer that question why you're on it. So if it's, you know, I'd rather you just exercise more regularly and ate a plant-based diet if heart's, a heart attack is your concern. If it's, you know, it's protective against, I said, bone fractures, and that holds true, um, and you already have osteoporosis, um, then maybe we need to do some bisphosphonates and weight bearing exercise. So there are always other things you could consider for the reason you wanna be on hormones. The most common reason though, truth be told, is just to stave off the hot flashes um, and try to kind of chase that fountain of youth a little bit longer with thicker hair and uh, not dry wrinkly skin and dry vaginas, like that's a big one too. So vaginal dryness, again, there's other things. There's Mona Lisa Touch and Thermiva, which are laser treatments that build up collagen. I've found an incredible product that you can do in the privacy of your home called CO2 Lift V. Um, it's like a, it's a mixture thing that you just push uh, this gel up into the vaginal area and it just hangs out there for 45 minutes and you wash it off. And it, it creates a hypoxic environment transiently that brings a rush of blood flow to the area and it creates moisture and um, elasticity and it works. So there are things you can be doing. And if you haven't explored those, I would suggest you do. Um, I scoured the earth for years and years, and it took me 17 years to find Menopause Miracle, which is three, it's a three Asian herb blend. It has three randomized controlled trials in humans against placebo where they did blood draws. It does not elevate estrogen. It doesn't impact the liver metabolism of your 
breast cancer drugs, if you're on them or any drugs, it doesn't impact those pathways uh, in the liver. And more importantly, in over 90% of women, whatever was bugging them went away. Hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, mood swings, itchy skin, it helped everything, insomnia. So I would have people try that before they leap into hormone replacement. What about bioidenticals? These often come from some of my favorite foods like soybeans and yams, and it sounds so like pretty and yummy and harmless. Um, but the truth is bioidenticals, they're just morphed from their natural state, right? You're not eating soy. Oh, I mentioned yesterday, actually, PCRM just came out with a new study on hot flashes in soy and showed uh, against placebo that it does in fact decrease hot flashes substantially. Um, but I digress. So the bioidenticals, they just haven't been studied. There's not a single large volume high quality clinical trial that tests these drugs, these medications, plant-based or not, they've been morphed from their original whole food form. And who knows if they remain as protective as they are in their food form, like maybe they're even harmful now by the way they've been altered. And without studies, we just don't know. Um, if we're reducing the problems that the WHI, the big study showed in 2002, or for exacerbating them. Um, so that, that's my take. If you are, at the end of the day, going to take hormone replacement therapy, though, I would choose bioidentical over your typical um, industrial pharmacologic grade hormone replacement. Thank you. So uh, my question was, what's, what's wrong with fish? Uh, what's the deal with fish? And, um, you know, I get these questions a lot about a specific food or type of food. Uh, you know, what about eggs? Can I have an egg? What about fish? Can I have fish? Uh, what about dark chocolate? What about coffee? What about, and um, those are natural, normal questions to ask. And it's got to be frustrating uh, for me to, <laughs> to keep hearing the answers say, it is really hard to know the long-term effects of one single food or ingredient or, uh, you know, a, a small category of foods. Um, you know, people who eat more fish generally, they're not, uh, you know, they're not replacing, you know, it's not like they would have fish or they would have broccoli. It's fish or beef, you know, so people in diets, for example, who uh, dietary patterns that have a little more fish typically also have more fruits and vegetables and less of other types of meat. And so we see sometimes see in observational studies that uh, diets containing uh, fish can can have uh, be associated with some health benefits. But um, you know generally, I think uh, uh, I, I don't recommend fish uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, fish. Uh, is just a mixture of animal protein and fat. And if you want the fat and omega-3s, I'd suggest you choose ground flaxseed or chia seed. Um, there's actually some direct research on, on ground flaxseed and uh, breast cancer um, that was showing some benefit. Um, so you can get your omega-3s from plant sources of food. Uh, you skip on the animal protein. You know, If you look at some of the other effects of animal protein, for example, on cholesterol levels, there's research that all animal proteins, you know, these are proteins from a muscle cell, all animal proteins uh, act similarly, more similarly to other animal proteins than they do plant proteins, which makes sense. You're eating a muscle. So these are all muscle cells. So, um, you know, the, the, in whether the muscle flaps a tail or, you know, or, or walks its uh, on legs, it, it, it's a muscle cell. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, the animal protein, for example, can raise cholesterol um, more effectively than can uh, uh, plant proteins. Um, so I, I think that uh, you don't need fish. I think um, you can do without it. Um, I recommend avoiding it. Uh, and obviously there's also some other things like heavy metals in, in fish and some heavy metal exposure. People are eating a lot of fish or at, at certain parts of the lifespan can be, it can be um, more concern. Um, and then there's the other elements of, uh, you know, this is not health related, but my goodness, you start learning about the health of our oceans, for example, and what fishing is doing to the health of our oceans and the plastic in our oceans and all the fishing nets that make the huge amount of plastic in the oceans. And um, there's, there's no, uh, I, I just, I can't get behind it. I just, you know, from a human health point of view, I, I can't say, 
I'm 100% certain based on really good research, but gosh, the indirect evidence is, is nothing special for fish and there's some concerns. And, um, and then you look at some of the other uh, non-health factors and, and my goodness, I, I would just avoid it. Well, one follow up to that. A lot of us are in a mindset that we are 100% whole food plant-based and it's, we feel strong. If someone says, yeah, I, I eat fish once a month, does that concern you? Like, is it, is it important to be 100% hardcore, never veer? Or are you saying, um, eat a whole food plant-based diet and if once a month you had fish, it's not great, but it wouldn't be a big concern? I'm glad you asked that because that, that I, I neglected to mention that perhaps my biggest concern <laughs> that I neglected to mention, perhaps my biggest concern is, is the behavioral aspect. People living in America are surrounded by meat and cheese and processed food all the time in their families, their workplaces. They drive past a dozen places, you know, every day. And when you start allowing things that, you know, I can't really be sure to say this is going to be terrible for you or not, but you start negotiating with yourself that, okay, I'm going to have some fish in my experience probably 90% of people are negotiating in other ways too. So they're going out, they're having the fish meal at the restaurant. Well, they're having some fatty stuff over here with some oils and some sugars. They're having some desserts over here. And as soon as in our current environment, when you start negotiating the edges, you're in 90% of people are going to slide further than they think they are. Now, there are that small percentage of people who, uh, you know, I've had patients and um, who have achieved amazing health benefits with a whole food plant-based diet applied strictly. But then, you know, they say, okay, once every three months, I'm going to go out and have whatever, the big restaurant meal that I love. And it's totally unhealthy, totally off plan. And literally, that is the only time they go off plan. You know, the percentage of people who do that, who can do that and are, you know, from a behavioral perspective, you're talking low, I, I think it's probably low single digit percentage of people. So it's really a behavioral. So some of my recommendations around this are behavioral that, that um, you know, one of the most dangerous aspects of the rationalization, this little bit won't hurt, is that it's true. It's that, if you had a perfect diet and three ounces of fish a week, is it going to do you in? I don't think so. I know <laughs> it's not. Um, but if you're saying this little bit won't hurt for fish, you're probably saying it for a lot of other things too. And that's where you're going to get into trouble. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next questions, Dr. Bard, um, how do you treat cancer if you get it? What works and what doesn't and what percent of the time? And uh, Dr. Funk, you could comment on that too. Um, Dr. Campbell, um, can we starve cancer cells by eating green sprouts, wheatgrass and green juices? Um, or, or fasting. In other words, there's a whole bunch of people saying, um, eat an all raw green juice, green sprout diet, and you'll starve the cancer cells. Is that something that you believe from your intuition and your research that makes sense to you? And then Dr. Funk, um, what would you like to say to all the men and all the husbands out there in what is the most supportive thing they could do if their wife is going through menopause, if their wife has breast cancer, if the wife is having a breast removed, if a wife suddenly has very low sex drive, what would you like to tell all the men and all the husbands is the most supportive thing that they could do? So if we could answer those three questions. All right, so the question was treating cancer, the options. The, the first option is not to treat it, just to watch it which we already discussed for the high rate of watchful waiting in, in pancreatic, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, prostate cancer. Now, 
when I grew up in uh, medicine, there was also a high rate of breast cancer that didn't kill two. Specifically, as a medical student, there was a woman who had a proven breast cancer. This was uh, at Syracuse uh, up at the, the medical center. And because she was mentally incapacitated, she refused to have the lumpectomy or any treatment at all. So when I saw her, this was 35 years after she had been diagnosed at a university hospital with breast cancer and nothing happened. It sat there, it stayed there. So this is the question, what, what prevents cancer from spreading? And if the body is going to fight off or die, it's going to fight off. Uh, what about trying plant therapy before uh, treating, uh, treating something with uh, the usual triad of radiation, chemotherapy, or now the current thing is on, you know, uh, oncoimmunology. By the way, the side effects potentially of these, these treatments are really, really horrible. I've been working with uh, chemo brain and with, with, this, with the COVID thing, we're doing a lot of work with investigational neuroimaging and the, the effect of the virus and of course of uh, environmental toxins on, on the brain and brain fog. This is really a serious issue. So people have to ask themselves one, two th or three times, do you wanna treat this at all? Or just go with lifestyle change and, uh, okay. But that being said, what is the, what kind of tumor are you dealing with? And where is it? Is it a focal tumor, which is amenable to focal treatment? I started off doing focal prostate can uh, cancer treatment uh, 25 years ago or so. And <clears throat> if the treatment was small at that time, we were using focused ultrasound, which had been used in brain cancer treatment 70 years ago from time to time. But focused ultrasound, you see it with ultrasound, you kill it under high intensity focused ultrasound and it's gone. The next thing we did, the next stage of focal treatment was using lasers. You see the tumor, you put the laser needle inside the tumor bed and heat it so you destroy the tumor using temperature references around the, the capsule and other sensitive areas so that you don't destroy tumor outside the uh, tissue outside the tumor or the, the, the area that you're treating. So this is image guided therapy. And how do you know if the treatment worked or not? By measuring the real time blood flow in a cancer. Cancers have feeding blood vessels, you measure them before you treat, and during a focal treatment, you follow up with it after the treatment, see if there's any uh, blood flow left in the area. Or if it's, a, if it's a freezing treatment, you can do this on the, if there's an ice ball where a tumor was, because the, the freezing turns everything into a shell of a mass of, uh, of frozen tissue, and it looks like the surface of a baseball. So this was so successful in the prostate that some of my patients have opted to do it in breast cancer and skin cancer imaging. As a matter of fact, the, the inventor of the focal, the, the high food technology used it on his own skin cancer. He killed it. And this was many years ago. So the, the technology can be used in many other areas. As a matter of fact, in, in Europe, it's used routinely in uh, thyroid cancer. You, you do cryoprobes and lasers, uh, all this to treat things with uh, focal therapy. So if it's not focal therapy, then you, you have to go do this um, preferably targeted radiation therapy. <clears throat> I gave a lecture at the uh, New York Proton Center almost a year ago now in better targeting of tumor. Why does cancer return after a treatment? Probably because you didn't treat it well enough or didn't get it at all. How do you ensure you get more area treated properly? When you're using radiation on a tumor, 
it can change. Uh, somebody hiccups and the prostate will move out of the, the tumor field or uh, there's a, the, the colon isn't properly prepared and the bowel movement pushes a, a ovarian tumor out of the radiation field or it twists. So th these, these are things that have to be watched with real-time imaging. In other words, you image the treatment on the organ as it's being done. This gives you a, well, a better treatment field and you're less likely to uh, harm adjacent normal tissue. Uh, the immuno-oncology, I, I work with, um, as a matter of fact, Tom, you mentioned uh, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I am working with a book uh, on, with one of your colleagues, Jesse Stoff, who was from Atlanta or Arizona, I believe he was. He was one of the people at the, at the beginning of the, the CTCA, the Cancer Centers of America. So he's an immuno, immuno-oncologist now, and we're doing pretty good work. But again, the, the side effects, if you go to any of the pathology lectures, especially uh, on dermatology, with skin falling off and really brutal side effects from these technologies, you want to see if the treatment is working before you continue with a, an aggressive treatment. This is why we use the blood flow technology to see if the tumor is responding to the aggressive therapy in real time. Now in San Francisco, we were able to establish that radiation therapy in the prostate that was really working would start to decrease tumor flow in a week or two, as opposed to seeing the shrink in two or three or four months. So monitoring the tumor with the newer technologies we have, the blood flow technologies, is a better way to treat. So you get the tumor and you don't, you minimize side effects from the treatment. Um, surgery is obvious, we, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, surgery is obvious. <laughs> so um, how do I treat uh, breast cancer and how successful am I at it? Um, there are six main ways to come after your breast cancer. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, biological targeted agents that hone in specifically on uh, like a receptor. For example, Herceptin is a drug that is not chemo. It is a biologic targeted agent. Anti-estrogens, uh, generally in the form of pills, dietary changes, and lifestyle changes. I am a breast cancer surgeon, so I operate on virtually all breast cancers. I have an open mind and embrace complementary strategies. So that also makes me attractive to people who do um, things that are very unconventional and very likely to fail. Um, but I don't criticize them and I work with them and I let them do their thing. It's their life, it's their cancer, it's their choice. It's, I'm all good with it. Um, I'll monitor it and hold their hand and then cut it out when it grows. But um, sometimes those efforts are successful and that's sort of the answer to a different question. So the answer to this one is that how do I treat it? Literally, I am the surgeon, so I operate. That might be a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. I'm 100% successful at getting the cancer out um, because there's an end to it. Like you're ultimately you get clear margins and I got the cancer out. Whether or not it comes back is all an insurance policy. It's all those other things are all about. Um, except diet and lifestyle, which is also staving off your future heart attack, stroke, diabetes, what have you. But the point is, it, the number varies, but about 25% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer will die from it. They're not diagnosed in that moment at stage four, but it's gonna come back and it'll come back metastatic and it will eventually end their lives. So whether or not you do chemo, whether or not you radiate, whether or not you take the anti-estrogen pills, it's all hedging your bets on if you're in the 25% or you're not. And it's never presented to women that way, at least in my experience and to my knowledge. It's always just like, this is a biologically aggressive tumor. If you don't do chemo, there's a high risk of it coming back. And like absolute numbers aren't really thrown around. Some people aren't numbers people and that wouldn't help them make their decisions anyway. But um, there you have it. So those are the different modalities with which we treat breast cancer. We are 
largely um, successful when you look at the averages, right? The average woman will not die from her breast cancer, but we're, it's woefully inadequate um, in terms of cure that there's still, you know, 40, 41,000 women who will die from breast cancer in this country every single year. And it doesn't have to be that way. The other question you asked um, was, men, what do I have to tell you about the most important thing you can do to support a woman in your life going through breast cancer? And, you know, couples are different and every major life stressor and breast cancer diagnosed in a wife or partner is definitely one of them will either you will never leave a couple the same you're not going to emerge from that the way you walked into it you're either closer or farther away oddly um, couples who emerge farther away do not have higher divorce rates um, you think they would but they don't um, so now they're just unhappy and still together so along those lines i think the single most important thing you can do is recognize if it actually is distancing you you're paralyzed, you're so confused, or there's anger, whatever the issues are, especially if they existed before the diagnosis, they're going to get exacerbated and lit on fire potentially by this major stressor, depending on how severe the cancer is and the treatments are. So maybe gently suggesting couples therapy could be the most therapeutic thing you do to make your wife or spouse feel empowered um, and loved by you. Then it could be simpler things like guess what? You got dinner tonight and you're going to surprise her with her favorite food, or you're actually going to take the day off work and whatever makes her happy, like a spa day is going to happen. Or you're going to take care of the kids for the next three hours and she should go out to dinner with her girlfriends. Or you're going to attend the appointments and take notes. I can't tell you how many spouses aren't in the cancer consultations that I give every day. So just showing up, you don't have to have the right words. Empathetic, listening. It's a major skill that many people lack. That's Thank you. It. So the question for me was, um, can you eat to starve cancer? And, and also, can, can I expand on that question? Can you eat to starve cancer? And, and also, um, just what is, um, what is your main focus and interest right now? Or just to, so what, what is, can you eat to starve cancer? And just what is your research and main focus um, at this time in your life? So the, both those questions. Yeah, so can you eat to starve cancer? I, I, I'm not exactly sure what that implies. In my mind, when I hear that, I think if there's some sort of protocol that you could do that would, you know, uh, have a, have a pretty high certainty of sort of turning off cancer or regressing cancer or something like that. And uh, as far as that more ex extreme sort of interpretation, you know, do this protocol reverse cancer of all, of all types, I just don't know of that. Um, there, there, you know, if you look at fasting, if you talk about star starving, <laughs> if you look at uh, just water only fasting. There, there has been some interesting cases at True North Health Clinic um, where they do water only fasting. At, at length, they published a case, re, uh, a case of a, of a person who had a, a lymphoma and uh, saw a regression of their lymphoma. Um, I've also known people who have gone uh, at, for a period of fasting uh, with a cancer diagnosis who went on to die from their cancer diagnosis uh, in relatively uh, quick fashion. So I don't, um, you know, there's no hard and fast um, guarantee. I, I, I do think that, and this answers to your other question, Steve, which is my interest. I think if you look at the balance of evidence out there, I think there is great hope that uh, dietary interventions done right, uh, done strictly enough, and uh, representing a big change in the, in the pre-diagnosis uh, pre diet, I think there's a, there's a, I, I hope, I hope that there's a chance that they can improve risks um, of, of cancer progression, of death from cancer. Um, but, you know, the dietary studies that have been done, as I've mentioned before, have studied relatively small changes in diet for short periods of time. And, uh, uh, you know, there haven't been even many of those. So, it hasn't been studied well enough. If you look at, um, you know, as far as, again, another, another 
case of eating to starve cancer, there's some, many people here probably heard of the Gerson therapy. And um, the Gerson therapy, they published a paper uh, looking at their, you know, looking at their patient experiences, um, just their observations of patient experiences over the years with melanoma. And they found that their survival rates um, for most stages of melanoma um, were higher than what would be expected from general population survival rates. And that had, you know, all sorts of juices and, and um, you know, plant-based uh, diet and coffee enemas and, you know, a, a lot of al alternative protocols. Um, but uh, you still had the people with, you know, distant metastatic disease in that, in that observation, in that cohort, that, you know, none of them survived for five years. So I think that um, uh, with stage 4B, so I think it's, it's a little, it, you know, it makes me a little bit worried with this idea, eat to starve cancer, because it implies that somehow if you find the right dietary protocol, that works. It's, there's a high certainty of it working and you don't need to do anything else. And that makes me, that makes me really pretty darn nervous. Um, and I, I think, I, I do hope uh, that diet makes a difference, but, um, and I'm looking to, my, my interest is to, to find that out, um, at least some part of that uh, question, but, um, but it's, uh, and I do think it, it, it likely can, I mean, there's tons of anecdotes, but uh, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about this stuff. Okay, thank you very much. If you would like to ask the doctors a question, please raise your hands. You can click on the reactions tab at the bottom and then click the raise hand button and we can call on you. When I call on you, please uh, tell us your name and where, tell us, uh, just tell us where you are from, okay? I'd um, like to ask Dr. Funk a question on tumor margins because how do you, when you've taken out a breast tumor that's focal, um, how do you know you've got all of it? Are you using the optical imaging, the fluorescent imaging or? or uh, pathology when it goes to the pathologist? Right, I use intraoperative ultrasound and we have a Faxatron, which is like a microwave looking mammogram image of the piece you take out. So you can get radiographically clear margins. We're not doing any frozens on margins or fluoroscopy or any kind of other. So it's final pathology, which you get like three to five days later. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, question. Joe, where are you from and would you like to ask a question? I'm calling from uh, Huntington, Long Island, New York. Um, Dr. Funk, um, I'm just wondering if you could give me maybe a percentage of the patients that opt for lifestyle, diet, and opt out of perhaps radiation or any invasiveness, um, and what their success is in dealing with uh, a breast cancer? When it's recommended, right? Because it's not always recommended. When people kind of buck the conventional, like you really should be radiating or doing chemo based on what we know. I would say in my practice, remember I attract people who are bent that way. Um, I would say 20% of people don't do quote unquote what is recommended to do. And so far in my experience, those who are really aggressive tumors um, and triple negative is what I'm thinking of and the HER2 positive, about 30% of those who don't take the therapy that they really needed for having a very aggressive tumor um, end up recurring either locally in the breast from a lack of radiation or out there in the body from not doing the chemo. Do you, do you think that um, they weren't adhering to perhaps you know a rigorous lifestyle change uh, that maybe their efforts weren't as uh, forceful as perhaps they could have been if maybe they had greater support or they were a little bit more uh, educated on how to go about it? What, what do you think? Possibly in a few, but I would say largely it's the biology of the cancer. So like the people who are successful at staving off a recurrence, oftentimes it is from their efforts, but they also had like the perfect storm brewing because they had a very estrogen dominant tumor that divided slowly. So if you eat anti-estrogenically, 
in the tumor with that kind of bombardment of these uh, anti-estrogen foods taking away its fuel would never have occurred until you were 185 years old. Boom, you get to say you cured your cancer, right? Um, but did you, if you lived to 200? So I, it's, it, I haven't done that detailed level of um, analysis on the patients who don't do recommended therapy to answer you accurately. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Denise, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Hi, yes, I would love to. I love this informative panel so much. I'm from Tucson and I'm actually a whole food plant-based educator with retirement programs. Here's my question, it's on casein. I was a vegetarian for 30 plus years and I watched Forks Over Knives when I was 60. And when I heard of Dr. Campbell's belief that casein could promote cancer, I was a 100% plant-based eater the very next day, and I've now been that for 10 years. Um, and Dr. Funk, when I read your wonderful book, I think that I might have read in there that you didn't think that casein um, had an effect on breast cancer. Perhaps I'm remembering wrong, but I wondered if you could address that because I've been always thinking since you know forks over knives, and then you know following Dr. Campbell for all these years that casein could be a promoter of cancer. So I was wondering if maybe, maybe both of you could address that. You wanna go first, Dr. Campbell? Yeah, I think um, certainly in some experimental models, namely my, my dad's experimental models, looking at uh, liver cancer in rats uh, with, with uh, liver cancer initiated by a carcinogen, casein was a cancer promoter. Um, so does that apply to all cancers or humans? Um, you know, there's a lot of leaps there and which we both would admit, uh, both him and I. Um, if you look at some of the surrounding evidence though, for example, on, um, on dairy, you know, if you increase your dairy intake, I mean, they did this study, they just did nothing else, but told people to increase their dairy intake and uh, lo and behold, their IGF-1 went up, and IGF-1 is a growth factor. <clears throat> it can be a, uh, elevated. IGF-1 is a risk factor for various cancers. So you start getting these indirect things. Um, but it's not, it, it, you know, again, it goes back to this question of does a single uh, food item or component or ingredient, do we know for sure exactly what it does? No, uh, we don't. Um, you know, there's some observational studies showing, for example, that... Uh, that that milk intake can be protective and colon protective and colon cancer. So um, you know it's not uh, it, it's not a slam dunk in terms of the, you know the overall dietary pattern matters more than casein. I, I would say to you though, if you've been a strict whole food plant based diet, what, why would you go back to dairy? I I, I wouldn't um, you know just be maybe because you miss cheese or something. I I if that's if that if that that's an assumption. You didn't say this, but. If, if that was a thought, I would, I would uh, say, wait a minute, there's, there's enough um, sort of indi indirect evidence to, to say that um, is unnecessary. So, yeah, I do think maybe you're misremembering in the book. The only time I talk about casein is to talk, to mention that it is 80% of the protein comprised of milk and that it takes 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. So you've got this like ooey gooey considerably uh, caloric and high fat ball of delicious goo, depending on who you are. Um, and uh, that's when I talked about casein. That was the only time. And I didn't talk about it as specifically as a cancer promoter. However, what are you going to find it in? You're going to find it uh, in these milk-based products. And one study, LACE, Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study, followed um, 2200 early stage breast cancer patients for about 10 years. And they found that those breast cancer patients eating one or more daily servings of high fat, not low fat, dairy, increased their all cause mortality by 49% versus those consuming less than half a serving per day. So it's often what the casein's in and then, you know, the whole meal itself that involves the casein that might be um, to your health detriment. But no, I don't, I didn't talk about casein as a direct link to cancer promotion. And 
can I add one more thing? I'll add that um, with dairy and casein, because you know I've been my brain is thinking breast cancer because what I've been doing in this conversation obviously is more breast cancer. But there is perhaps if you're going to look at the health effects of one single food or one sing, small food group on cancer, mm -hmm. in my opinion, there's perhaps no greater connection between a, a, a dietary component and cancer than there is between dairy and prostate cancer and dairy being a bad actor. And you see that um, with enough consistency and enough times that, and you start putting all these things together, um, you know, whether, whether it's casein is, is automatically, um, you know, the bad actor or not. Uh, I think obviously as a scientific statement, you've got to have some conservative understanding of that and cautious assessment of that. But, uh, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't recommend it. James, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Yes, thank you very much. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And I just uh, direct this to Dr. Campbell. Uh, I loved your father's book, um, uh, just very inspirational. Um, a, a cancer survivor, mental cell lymphoma seven years ago. Um, I saw I read your dad's book and I've been whole food plant-based almost four years. Also went gluten-free. Just want to get your idea, any, any other thoughts of anything else I could be doing, eating tree bark or anything else that might help. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're doing a great job. You know, um, it, again, you get into uh, specific cancers and cancer go. types and, and uh, stages and stuff. And, we, and unfortunately, this is a great now. frustration. You know, this, this actually, um, it, 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 research has been proposed for dietary therapy for cancer. And my dad has uncovered this. We did it, our family was, while well, he was on a sabbatical in Oxford, he would go to these old um, libraries and look up some of the original stuff. And, and it's in his book, The Future of Nutrition, which is wonderful. Um, and he talked about some of this past stuff. And, and you know, it was, it's been hundreds of years that physicians have said, you know, hey, wait a minute, these people eating this diet seem to be doing a little better. They seem to be a little healthier. Let's go ahead and do a study. Let's, let's see if you take cancer patients and put them on this diet, um, what will happen? And, and do you know what? It just, it just hasn't been done with the exception of a few dietary studies that make small changes to a Western diet. And that's not the type of research that excites me. So um, it's greatly frustrating. I think, you know, based on the, on the research I know and the indirect evidence, you know, go for it with what you're doing. Um, you know, it, 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 in general, I would recommend that for people struggling with a, with a diagnosis. Uh, certainly um, in terms of, you know, specific diet stuff. I mean, that's, I, I have, when I give specific personal recommendations, I look at food diaries and I go over food diaries and I, um, you know, go through the medical history and talk about all that stuff. So um, you know, for, for a very specific personal recommendation, maybe there's some tweaks or something, but you're, but you know, I think the general approach of a whole food plant-based diet sounds reasonable. Lori, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Yes, I'm from New Jersey. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm have some concerns about, and thank you for this wonderful series. This has been so enlightening and wonderful. Appreciate. Um, I, my husband uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer during this COVID time and uh, um, was treated for five days with radiation. Um, no, it was not staged up in any way, you know, like bone scans or anything. So I'm very concerned. I wonder if it has to do with the kind of insurance he has with the HMO Medicare or whatever, but um, then he had also developed like breathing, you know, he never smoked. Um, they thought, oh, he's got COPD, this, that. No, that wasn't it. And anyway, now it's like the latest thing. Oh, it's nasal polyps. So now, um, unfortunately, the ENT that he had seen just concerns me because I'm trying to keep his immune system well. Um, they had some kind of a novel biological nucala, some new kind of a drug that was, from my research, was just only approved for nasal polyps um, July 29th, 2021 by the FDA, but it's an mRNA thing, which is altering things. And I'm very concerned about this treatment. Do any of you know about that? And I, from, 
you know, when I'm thinking it's um, not so good. And then also you self inject this stuff into you. I don't know what lab it's coming from. I try to talk to this doctor. They don't seem to want to address my concerns. And um, I did call some number and I said, the patient, because he got COVID then um, on top of this all and uh, uh, this stuff just still came and he self-injected himself. He didn't listen to me. And I don't know if there's any thing you can suggest to me to try to help his immune system with the cancer and now this nightmare with this new color for nasal polyps. Does anybody help me? Do you know of any doctors that might be able to help? Well, uh, I'm sorry to hear your dif difficulty. Um, you're in your husband's difficult course here. I, I don't have any specific recommendations for you, unfortunately. I mean, it sounds like it's been kind of a complicated array of uh, treatments and workups and diagnostic things and um, mm -hmm. it'd be hard to comment on. I mean, I'm we're here talking about diet and lifestyle. I think uh, it's worth pursuing those things in general. I tell that to everybody. Um, but it's, it's a little hard to comment on some of your other specifics. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, I don't have any knowledge about nasal polyps or how they're best treated. Okay. Um, v, VT, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Uh, yes, um, my name is uh, Vivian, and I am from California. And uh, my question is um, regarding mam mammogram. And I'm just wondering, is, um, is that good to have? And how often should we have? Should we have ev every year? Or is there another, um, another form of diagnosed um, that we can use? Thank you. So I... Recommendations vary from society to society. You'll hear starting at age 40, you no know, start at 50, get them every year, get them every other year, stop when you're 74, never stop. I um, advise starting at age 40 for normal risk women and continuing every year without stopping or skipping years until your life expectancy from maybe other illnesses is less than 10 years. If you are dense breasted, I always add whole breast screening ultrasound to the regimen as well. And if you're high risk, defined as a 20% or greater lifetime risk of breast cancer, I add MRI uh, variably. It could be uh, every three years, every five years, every two. It depends on your story. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to ask a question? Where are you from? Yes. Hi, Steve. So grateful that you put this together every year. I'm from South Brunswick, New Jersey, and this question is directed to Dr. Funk. Um, a couple of years ago at The Real Truth About Health, Dr. Dever Davis showed a movie called SAP, and I distinctly remember them showing tumors of on women's breasts, the, the shape of cell phones. And I just wanted to ask now, uh, just out of curiosity, is there, are you seeing an increase in younger women in breast cancer? And can you attribute that to cell phones? Or to so um, no and no. The increase in risk in younger women actually hasn't changed since 1985. It's been rock stable. So it feels like it's more common because of the uh, lack of taboos now around discussing breast cancer and there's tons of social media and media outlets that'll have celebrities talking about it, et cetera. So it seems more common and on places like Facebook or Instagram, you'll suddenly see that a friend's friend's 24 year old daughter has breast cancer and we never would have known about that a decade or plus ago. So now it just feels more uh, prevalent in the younger population. Overall breast cancer incidence goes up 0.3% per year. Um, and uh, that's been in since 2012, but in postmenopausal women. And cell phones have been evaluated in terms of their risk, uh, put the risk they pose to uh, breast and breast cancer, but there has been no causal connection identified. I looked through all of the 
research when I was writing my book about that and there's nothing scientifically proven. I'd like to see that video with the cell phone shaped cancers. <laughs> That's kind of strange too. I mean, do you get, do you eat a lot of, if we decide it's from all the meat, is <laughs> the cancer in the shape of a, like little cow? <laughs> That'd be funny if it like said, this is why I'm here. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, if each of you could make a 30 second concluding statement, summing up your thoughts, and then also tell us how we could follow up with you, stay in touch with you, get your book, um, that would be great. Um, sure, so, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, diet and lifestyle is likely to matter a great deal um, for, for cancer prevention and potentially cancer treatment, but the operative word there is likely. I, I think that we need a lot more research. Um, the indirect research uh, suggests that there are some things that we haven't looked at. So, um, you know, whole food plant-based diet, I recommend and, and exercise, plenty of exercise. Exercise has been consistently linked to improved outcomes. Um, so, you know, diet and lifestyle, and of course, avoiding tobacco and other uh, substances is really important. And if I had a diagnosis that was threatening my life like, like this, despite the uncertainties, um, I, I certainly would, um, imagine, I mean, different people take it different ways it can, in, in whichever way they take it's fine. But, um, you know, if, if people want to do something about it, I would, I would, uh, encourage them strongly, um, to go in this direction of a whole food plant-based whole, whole food plant-based diet and exercise. Um, and if people want to go to hold of me, um, they can find me at myplantbasedprogram.com. Okay. Dr. Campbell, one suggestion. Um, Stephanie Senoff, the MIT scientist who's been doing a lot of research on glyphosate, says that um, they're using glyphosate not only on genetically modified foods, but to finish certain crops so that lentils and chickpeas that are not organic are getting, even though they're not GMO, they're being sprayed in the field with glyphosate. So maybe the terminology that we should all adopt going forward is we want a no chemical or organic, whichever word we're more comfortable with, a no chemical whole food plant-based diet or an organic whole food plant-based diet. Because I wouldn't want to encourage everyone to eat a plant-based diet and then be eating chickpeas and lentils every day and not being aware that it's sprayed with glyphosate. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, I'm certainly not a fan of chemicals, um, agricultural chemicals and the quantity that they're used. I, I think though, um, and this was, this was a kind of a principle from some of my dad's research is that, you know, it, if there's an effect on cancer, it, it's quite possible that the nutrition itself has a bigger effect than the, uh, than the, uh, than a chemical exposure. So, um, you know, again, do I want people out there eating Roundup? No, <laughs> but, um, should we, uh, you know, is it, is it, is it necessary to make their lifestyle, you know, much more difficult to avoid every bit of it? I think that's probably lower yield than adopting the, the, the actual better nutrient profile of a plant-based diet. Thank you. All right, and my summary would be to eat a glyphosate-free, largely organic, whole food plant-based diet, to exercise regularly, maintain an ideal body weight, minimize or eliminate alcohol. Um, watch your self-talk. Be positive and kind to yourself and love and forgive others. Sleep well, seven to nine hours a night meditate or find your happy and spend time de-stressing however you best do that and give back give to others give to the world and smile and laugh and love thank you um i want to thank dr bard who had a drop off at the end of this call very much for his his work and dr funk and dr campbell um i really appreciate you coming on and sharing this i appreciate the time you spent here and even more so, I appreciate all the years that while we were outside playing, doing whatever, you were learning this stuff so you could educate us. Um, this is a really big deal, this stuff. Cancer is scary, and it's fantastic to have people that have thought about this, studied this, researched it, and 
give us such you know clear reporting. So thank you very much. I'd like to unmute everyone so everyone else could thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.